Hi, my name is Luca Bitson. I run the R&D team with the Vodafone Group Technology and I did a presentation today to talk about our plans for narrowband IoT as a technology that we believe will address the uh, emerging market for low power wide area access. So this presentation it's, it's a relatively short pitch because I'm hoping that we can get to some more um, dynamic discussion amongst the panel members after this, so apologies if it's a bit short. I'll start off with the unashamed advert. So Vodafone is very proud to have been named best machine to machine to provider in the, in the world for the fourth year in a row from Analysis Mason just back in the summer. We very effectively used our 2G, 3G, 4G network assets to provide a global machine to machine service, which I think is the envy of, um, of many other operators. Supported by something, a little piece of technology that we developed in-house towards the start of that journey called GDSP, which allows us to have an industrial scale provisioning system for connecting, connecting things across the planet, whether it's running on our network or whether it's running on somebody else's and using the inherent roaming that you get from having um, a, a global technology behind this. Same story by the numbers, if you prefer this view. Um, so we actively manage over 20 million devices now across, um, well, 24 of our markets. So where it says Opco there, that's just Vodafone internal shorthand for operating company. So it's a, a market in which we've got a network operator. Um, we've learned a lot along the journey. So, so here, 24, 7, 365, this was initially a challenge. And you look at bringing down a, a network node in Germany and then not recognizing that it's going to take down customers in Australia because you're doing it at 3 a.m. in Germany it was a rude awakening for some of our operational guys early in the, in the journey. But thankfully, we're past all that now. We're, this is now a mature but rapidly, rapidly growing business for Vodafone. Um, so, and it's, uh, it's core to what, where we see ourselves growing in the future. So where have we come from? It's... Um, the stuff that we've done so far is very much based on using the assets that we have. So it's using licensed spectrum, it's, um, it's applying those global standards and it's, and it's developing technologies or developing propositions that can leverage the scale of the operation. Um, when we start to think about IoT, so moving beyond the, the more traditional view of machine to machine, and this, and I think previous speakers have referred to this, is one of the inherent challenges, is that machine to machine refers to a huge spectrum of, um, of things. Um, it's, it's everything from a 4K TV that's embedded in the back of your headrest of your high-end BMW, all the way down to something which might tell you if it's rained in a field in the past year, and everything in between. So when you start to consider the, the different characteristics of what constitutes a machine or a thing, then it's no surprise that there are a number of different, te different technologies and different opportunities that have been developed to address this, um, this emerging need. So we would say that IoT brings with it a whole load of new opportunities. It also brings, and I see it's, it's fallen off the bottom of the chart, also brings with it some new um, requirements. I wonder what else might drop off the bottom of the chart now, but we shall see. So this diagram on the left is a composite of many views that you will see from various um, analysts. All it's intending to show is the, the anticipated proportion of the market that will be addressed by different technologies. This is very consistent with what Guy was saying earlier. If you look at the, the proportion of the connectivity that's provided by today's cellular solutions and you look ahead um, to what proportion they will serve in the future, it's around 10 to 15 percent of the market. The majority right now is dominated by the short-range um, wireless, sorry, short-range uh, license-exempt wireless technologies. And in the middle, this is where we see the, the low-power wide area opportunity really starting to emerge and make a difference. Um, that's the piece that we believe is absolutely prime focus for us as operators. It's something that we believe can be addressed using our, our natural assets. And the, the fact that we haven't already got a technology to address this is, uh, is something that is a, a real frustration, but we are making some terrific progress on this, as we'll see in a moment. Now, this has some very specific requirements associated with it, which are captured in these four bullets. First one is, um, is scalability. So, again, referencing previous speakers, this thing has to be able to scale to support hundreds of thousands of devices per cell. 
So whichever number you pick, whether it's 10 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion in a certain number of years, if you look at what that means in terms of the number of devices that you need to be able to communicate with on the ground in a cell, it's huge. Whatever we do to, to provide the technology solution for this has to be architected in a way that allows that to work. So we're very, very conscious and cognizant of that requirement, and it's something that's been designed into the thinking of the technology that we've been developing. The second fundamental enabler is the range. So it's the, it's the wide area, if you like, in terms of the LPWA acronym. This is also terrifically important for our customers. So it's, it's not good enough to be able to offer a service on a national basis that works some of the time, might not work everywhere. The fundamental requirement that we recognised fairly early in this was that we had to have a solution that allows us to reach every corner of a given market. Whether or not somebody has got an inconveniently located electricity meter in their basement or they've got a sensor that's buried a meter below the tarmac. So we need to have something that allows us the, the confidence to deploy a technology that can reach practically everywhere, practically everywhere. Hugely important in terms of an enabler. So the design target there was to go a good 20 dBs beyond the edge of a GSM cell, which in practical terms means that in a country the size of the UK, um, you can achieve genuine national coverage using the type of cell tower assets that we have for our um, conventional services. Battery life, again, because of the nature of the deployment, I mentioned before, you bury these things, you put them in places where nobody visits for a long time. We had to have protocols that allow the device to remain active and a going concern for at least 10, preferably 15 years. Now, of course, this depends on the traffic model, how often it's um, communicating with the network and the nature of the application. But as a, as a design goal, this, is, this again is super important. So it has to be designed from the outset, not just the radio, but I think Caroline raised an excellent point as well. It has to be the full protocol stack. Everything from how you secure it through to how you let the network know that you're there has to be done in a way that facilitates that very, very long battery life. And it's not simple or trivial, and it can't be added at the end. It has to be done at the beginning. The final piece is cost, and we see this as being a hugely sensitive um, or rather, there's a lot of business model sensitivity and opportunity sensitivity to where you land on this. We see that if you have a device cost of the order of one or two dollars, there is um, a, much, a much, much bigger opportunity than one that costs five or six or seven. And in fact, it starts to decrease quite steeply once you go beyond that. So we see a lot of cost sensitivity in terms of the device and how it actually comes to market in a form factor that can be of value to somebody planning to integrate it into their technology. And that's a real, again, a, is a real business enabler. If you get it wrong, we don't address the market. If you get it right, you can probably double or triple your estimates for how many things will connect. So, opportunity and the requirements. So what are we doing? I think, Caroline, we, we mentioned before, and I think you're all aware that there are a number of technologies in this space. The one that we're talking about here is, um, is narrowband IoT, which I'm delighted to say, based on the, based on the fact that I was presenting to a, a conference only a month ago complaining about the lack of progress in standards, delighted to say that narrowband IoT is now something which has been agreed by 3GPP. We haven't finished all the details yet. The direction <coughs> is clear. We have the entire community of um, network infrastructure providers, chipset companies, operators now in unison around this being the technology that we use to address the LPWA market for those requirements. So this is a big, big achievement worth celebrating. Um, it means that a lot of the lurid headlines that you've seen in previous months about industry fragmentation and battles within, um, within the mobile world can cease to be a distraction. And we can concentrate instead on the stuff that really makes a difference, which is building an ecosystem getting the technology deployed, getting the chipsets available and starting to launch some services. That's where we're now placing our, our attention and our efforts and our, and our energy is on creating the market, not no longer on arguing or debating the best way of addressing it. That's done. You don't need to read this detail, but that's just to give you a flavour of the, uh, the decisions that were made in the round one meeting a couple of weeks back in Anaheim. Um, which, you know, the result there, it looks 
boring. It's not. It's uh, it represents a real step forward for the industry. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll clearly do some better graphics. <laughs> but that's the that's the actual work item that was agreed. Oh, sorry, the actual proposal that was agreed. Just the top of the document. So again, just to come back to this. So why do we why do we think this is something that that we can do? Um, you know, why why is cellular so relevant for addressing the Internet of Things? And I think, well, maybe just take a step back. I'm not going to start dismissing at all any of the other technologies that can be used to address this. It, you know, whether or not they're using licensed or unlicensed spectrum. I think what we're looking at is is the requirements that are coming to us from our customers, um, and the the characteristics that we can deliver using this type of technology deployed on our licensed assets. And that really comes down to these kind of collection of, of characteristics. One is around security. So the fact that you, we can secure this thing end to end from a single hop from the network to a device, no need for anybody to configure a, a gateway or a box in the middle, we believe delivers us some inherent advantages in terms of how we can manage security for end customers in a, in a much more predictable and um, industrialized way. So we think this is this is a big deal, and we see some of the um, uh, some of the disadvantages being played out in the press in terms of people who are building devices that are connected, like a you know a manufacturer of a kettle or a toaster or a connected microwave. They're not security experts. They don't understand the implications of the technology they're baking in that talks to a Wi-Fi access point in the home and might do something clever because it allows you to switch on your kettle to boil from your bed using your smartphone without realising that they're opening up the entire Wi-Fi network to anybody who wants to, to gain the, the credentials of the system. So what we're trying to develop with this is a way of being able to offer a very, very predictable, very robust level of security for end users. Um, predictable quality of service, again, this is just part and parcel of operating a licensed spectrum um, technology in the sense that we know what's going on in the spectrum. It's, it's our spectrum. We, we, we're not um, relying on people not setting up a competing service in the same spectrum, in the same location, which is something which we can't guarantee customers won't happen with some of the unlicensed technologies. So it's not to say that the, that the technologies are bad. It's just that the level of guarantees and quality that the customers are asking us to sign up to can't be delivered unless we've got control over the spectrum asset. Interoperability through global standards, so we, we really think this is important as well. Um, for big international global companies to be building solutions based on this standard, they need to have the confidence that it's going to work across the planet. They don't want to put together piecemeal solutions that work in one market and not in another, and they want to be able to have this supported by the ability to roam across the entire planet. Um, obviously, custom support. Synergy with other machine-to-machine -machine capabilities, again, is part and parcel of what we do. The final one, by the way, is recognising the fact that this dovetails very nicely with what we're doing with the evolution of LTE to the extent that we're able to support a, a very wide, diverse range of use cases, ranging from the very, very low-cost sensor-style network that's represented by LPWA and served by narrowband IoT, all the way through to the higher categories of LTE that connect your... Um, you know, your, your car to the internet. So what are we doing next? I think we've mentioned this a few times, that we need to, we need to get going now. We've got the technology. It, it is going to be developed by all of the network infrastructure providers. It is going to be deployed by a large number of um, global network operators. We've got very ambitious launch plans. We are, on the back of the standards agreement, planning to have the initial network deployments in service towards the end of next year, rapidly growing into multiple markets from that point onwards. So for people who need to be engaging with the community to build and integrate devices using this technology, my biggest concern is no longer the technology, is that nobody knows about it. It's that we don't have the awareness in the developer community to be able to build the, uh, the services and the, the applications that could be enabled through this um, through this technology. So we're putting together a community, if you like, a band of the willing. We're putting customers right at the heart of it. We're putting consumers, enterprises, vertical industries, smart cities, generation requirements. 
Um, we're working very closely with all of the mobile manufacturers, chipset guys, module manufacturers, to understand exactly how you integrate the technology based on those requirements. And we're providing support through the network infrastructure that we're building together through the, um, the, the, the operators, of course, and also through this thing called Open IoT Labs, which is aspiring to create a network of, of open labs across the world where people are aspiring to uh, develop applications or, uh, or new services based on this emerging technology you can start to become much closer to it now or in the very near future. So it's really about engagement and it's about building the entire ecosystem to really put a fire under this now that we have the technology. Um, so watch out for this. It's something we're launching in the next couple of months, but if, uh, if people are interested in, in participating in this beyond the people that are already shown, then um, you know my address. And uh, I'd welcome any further interest on that, because I think this is, the biggest, this is the biggest thing for us now. So I will leave it there.